Watching that minefield and... All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here for the Robo Sports Network Spring Conferences presented by WPI. Thank you for those of you who are watching live for your patience. We had a couple of technical issues. We saw some uh, problems with the video, so we're working hard to correct that and make it a great experience for everybody watching. Uh, but right now, joining me, I have here uh, Professor Ken Stafford from WPI. Ken, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, hi, uh, Francis. I'm glad to. I'm, uh, I, I enjoy talking about FRC because you folks, uh, some of you will recognize me that I've been the lead mentor for uh, FRC 190 for, uh, I don't know, about 20-some years. Uh, although I'm not anymore, I am retired now. But, um, but I've also retired from being an active professor at WPI, but I did teach robotics engineering uh, for uh, as long as we've had that program, and I'm still actively employed by WPI on an adjunct basis. So, um, and my background is mechanical engineering um, and aeronautical engineering, and, uh, and so uh, I taught at WPI for about, 20, about 26 years, I guess, before wow. I retired. So. Very cool. Awesome. And by the way, Ken, you are, by the way, the most, the busiest retired person I've ever met, especially considering yeah. you're, you're busy with still stuff from your job, but it's great. We love having you on. Um, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Uh, today, Ken will be presenting about FRC motors and transmissions, talking about all that kind of stuff. Um, but before we get started, some, something near and dear to both of our hearts, I want to thank the people who make this possible. And that's uh, WPI, WPI, Worcester Polytechnic Institute is a leader in project-based learning and was the first university to ha to offer not only a bachelor's of science, but also a master's and a PhD in robotics engineering. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, or you want to learn more about becoming a student or sponsoring a project with WPI, visit wpi.edu for all sorts of tons of, uh, of more information. Now, another thing too, if you're watching this live and you've got a question, just type exclamation point Q into the chat. We're going to take those questions, pull them out. And uh, if we like your question, we're going to ask Ken at the end uh, to have a little bit of a QA and a as we get toward the end. All right. With, that, with all of that out of the way, I'd like to hand the floor over to Ken, uh, who can uh, take us away and, and talk to us about motors. So Ken, have at it. All right, Francis. And by the way, if, you know, if um, uh, if it's a really pointed question that you really think needs to be answered right away, I don't mind being interrupted. So if Francis is willing to interrupt me, I'll, I'll answer the questions as they come along. Absolutely. So I love motors. I, I really enjoy uh, designing around them and teaching people how to work them. And there's there's a lot of misconceptions about them. Uh, those of you who have, who have uh, been around me very much know that I've had a version of this presentation in the past, but I have updated today with, with the um, FRC uh, 2020 motors. This is what we used to always look at. And for some of those folks that uh, have been around, they recognize that maybe there's only one or two motors in this pile that are still viable. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about those, but principally I want to talk about some of these uh, newer guys that are on there. And we're all familiar with the, the new revolutions in the brushless motors, but I got to tell you the little Johnson motor there is pretty cute too. It really replaces something that's been missing for a long time in our FRC kit. But let's get back to the, the fundamental understandings of motors. Um, brushed motors are pretty easy to understand. Most of us know how they work. We've built them out of nails and wires and, and all that kind of stuff. And basically they're just three major components. You have the stator, which is the stationary part of the motor um, that is that is in a, um, in a brushed motor is actually the the permanent magnet part of the case normally, and that's would be simplified by the, the north and south uh, magnets there on the outsides. It doesn't move, and just it's why it's called a stator. And then you have the spinny part, which is called the armature. And of course, that's really where the torque is developed through the electromagnetic interaction between the permanent magnets and these uh, wire coils, which become electromagnets. Now, the, the clever thing about um, DC motors in general is that yeah, we're using direct current from batteries to charge them, but whether or not it is a brushed or a brushless motor, at some point that DC has to be converted to alternating current in order for it uh, continuing the, the spin um, and, and not just stick there at north to south and south to north. On the brushed motor, that is done by the, by the action of the thing called the commutator. And this is simply the um, uh, very clever device with um, conductors such that every time the motor turns, the brushes which conduct electricity to it switch, switch on to different conductors, which then reverses the polarity of electromagnets to cause continuous rotation. 
Now that's the good news and the bad news. The, the good news is that it works seamlessly, no electronics required, it's uh, very robust. The bad news is, is that it does cost some sparking, uh, does cost some wear. These brushes are made out of carbon uh, generally. And so you can always tell um, a well-used brush motor because that's a bunch of carbon dust around it. Um, and also by the nature of the, uh, the way that the current is switched over there, there is a rather some abrupt changes in electricity, which causes some spikes, which are not necessarily great for uh, power production. So if we look at this, but keep in mind there's electromagnetic and there's a DC and an AC component of this. And we look there at brushless DC motors. Now, initially, there's, it seems like it's a magical difference. It's, it seems like a terrifically different kind of motor. They look different. They, uh, they cost more or less. They, they're, they just don't look the same. But really, the same fundamental things still happen. They're still the stationary part. But the big difference between a brushed and a brushless motor is that in the, in the a brushless motor, the stationary part are not the permanent magnets, but rather um, the electromagnets. In this, in this picture, they're the ones you see in the inside, they're electromagnets. They do not move. On the other hand, the part that spins, the rotor, the armature, is what now is made of the permanent magnets. So it actually spins. It's kind of the opposite of what happens with a brushed motor. Now, because we still have to change the polarity of electromagnets, we have to have something now which re doesn't rely upon the spinning of the commutator to switch the current. And so for that reason, um, all brushless motors do require some sort of electronic speed control that actually then uh, converts the, uh, the DC coming in to a synchronous AC. And the synchronous part means that the speed at which it changes from the polarity obviously has to correlate with the speed of the, uh, of the uh, rotor. Now that's done by two different measures. Um, a lot of motors, in fact, the ones that we have, the Neo and the, um, um, the Falcon, both use um, Hall effect sensors, which will tell when a magnet gets to a certain point in this, in this rotation, so it knows when to switch the current. And so that's, but you can also do it simply by measuring what's called back EMF. And some, of the, uh, some motors also, brushless DC motors also, uh, do not use Hall effect uh, sensors, which can break and can have some problems with them, but rather just use the, uh, the back EMS signal, which comes from a, uh, the coil that's not being energized. And so this, this is what you might see, and it's very much like the uh, two of the motors that we have in our kit, the Falcon and the uh, Neo. Now, by the way, this particular kind of uh, a BLDC is what's called an outrunner. And this is what you'd see if you're looking on most quadcopters and on the the powered skateboards, these are very, very high power density motors. This is where the, and on, on ones like the quadcopters and on the uh, powered skateboards, you'll actually see the armature is totally exposed and it sits there and spins around. It's excellent for cooling. It also, um, it also does, um, um, it, it also has the downside that things can interfere with it. You can, you know, it spins, so you can be hurt by it or things could, could get drug into it. Um, there is a, a secondary uh, kind of um, a brushless DC motor, and that's called an in-runner. An in-runner still has the stator with the uh, permanent coils, I mean the uh, electrical coils, and still has the armature, but now the armature is on the side rather than the outside. Um, these generally are used for higher speed motors, which are lower torque. Um, I, I think perhaps that the NIDEC uh, that we have is built this way. Looking at the outside of it, it looks like maybe that's what it is, the, the, the little NIDEC um, uh, Dynamo um, brushless DC motor that we, was the first one I guess we got in FRC. Um, but they, but it, they operate the same principles. Now, by the way, both, this, both of these two motors I'm showing are what's called a three-phase um, brushless DC motor. That's because there are three wires that come out of it to uh, power it. If you look back on this, uh, this one, you can see it quite a bit easier. And so in, in, in actuality, uh, these don't turn on and off uh, uh, like you might think the electromagnets are actually, there's all, all three of them are always on, in this case, all the time, but they're in different polarities. And the polarity is what switches around that causes the net magnetic flux to cause it to, uh, to, uh, to switch around. But one could ask why these are as particularly efficient as they are. There's several reasons why you should understand about brushless DC motors, which are distinctly different. Every DC motor requires current in the windings to develop electromagnetic force. That current produces heating. 
And so every DC motor has a byproduct of, of heat. Now, if you think about, if we think back on the, uh, on the uh, brushed motor, the part that gets hot are the windings there you see the, uh, uh, that are in the rotor. There is only one path, well there's, well, there's only one major path for the heat to escape, and that is through conduction and convection to the air around it. Because the only metallic conductive path is through the axle because there's no other contact with the rest of the motor. And so when the outside of a, of a brushed motor gets hot, it's because the air in it has gotten really hot and eventually the skin gets hot, but there's no direct path from the energy straight to the, uh, the mounting surface. It just has to go through the center of the shaft or through conduction uh, and out through the batteries to the outside shell. On, on brushless DC motors, since the armature is not rotating, it can be fixed to the permanent part of the mounting fixture. And so on, on very high powered motors, example, again, like the ones you see in uh, quadcopters and all, um, they can handle immense amounts of current because there is this direct me metallic conducting heat path from the non-rotating uh, stator right to the base and right to whatever a chassis can uh, accept it, that, that energy. Now, now, by the way, Unfortunately, um, the, the, the Falcon, for example, doesn't have this feature because where you would like to mount it to get the heat conducted straight through it is where the speed controller is mounted. And so, again, it, it has a rather torturous path to get the energy out of it, but it still uh, has high power. So let's look back, understanding that they both work on the same principles. Let's see the common things about all DC motors. So the most basic understanding. First off, they have one function, that is, to, that is to convert electrical power to mechanical power. Unfortunately, they also convert electrical power to thermal power, which is normally not what you want. And so you understand that it's always a trade-off that the more efficient that the motor is, the more uh, complete the conversion is to mechanical power, but they all do produce thermal power as well. Now, as an example, when you look at the efficiency of the motor, you're comparing how much comes into it with how much comes out. And those of you in thermodynamics who understand, well, it's 100% the same. Whatever energy comes in has to come out. And that is true. But you would like to have mechanical energy as opposed to thermal energy. So the input is going to be volts times amps, which is a nice figure of watts. Uh, an example of the, the very um, common sim big black motor is if you are operating at its maximum continuous, uh, which is 40 amps, then you could say the electrical power coming in is 40 times 12, so it's 480 watts coming into that motor. Now, the mechanical output of any motor is, is the work divided by time, but another way of thinking about it is the RPM times the torque. Now, you have to put some conversion factors there to get to watts or horsepower, but, but it's the same figure. Now, on that same SIM motor, at 40 amps and 12 volts, it would be running at 3,800 RPM and producing about 6.15 inch-pounds of torque. If you do that multiplication out and multiply it by the conversion, you come up with a net mechanical power of 275 watts. That seems pretty good. But now look, we started with 480, and we go down to 125. Or excuse me, we go down to um, 275. And so the question is, what happened to the rest of the power? And you all know the answer there. Uh, in this case, about 105 watts uh, comes out as heat. And so that means this thing's only like about, you know, 60%, 65% efficient. The, so, the motors? Hey, hey, real quick, Ken, actually. So yeah. um, we've, we've seen like some published information from like the folks who do the, the Falcon talking about yeah. how the motor is like a 700 watt motor on occasion, right? Yes. But it would yes. look like if you're at a 40 amps and 12 volts, you can never actually get to anywhere close to that, right? How does, how does yeah. that work? And so and so if you were to, the, the great question, uh, Francis, if you were to look now and, and say, and we do know, by the way, by FRC rules that we're not allowed to power any motor by more than a, with, without at least a, with nothing large than a 40 amp circuit breaker in there. So, and we all know, by the way, that, that a 40 amp circuit breaker can handle more than 40 amps for, for a period of time. But nonetheless, it's, it's very, very unwise to ever count on having more than 40 amps worth of performance out of a motor. So if we go back to this same bit here, but now look at the Falcon, it would be 40 amps at maximum and 12, and 12 volts. So by the way, that means it is also inputting the exact same amount of 480 watts. However, if you do this, and we'll show this a little bit later, it turns out that 
that under the same conditions, the, the Falcon, which is very, very efficient, is actually putting out almost 400 watts. And so it only loses about uh, 20 percent, actually, what, 80 out of uh, whatever. So it's like 20 percent at that point. So it's, it's over 80 percent efficient at that point compared to about 60 some percent efficient. So they're not lying to us. It actually is that much more efficient. And the efficiency, by the way, I, I talked a little bit about how Russia's motors can operate hotter. That is true. But that is not necessarily more efficiently. There is some small improvement based upon the fact that there is no brush drag. Brush drag is a small but measurable amount of drag. Also, um, sim motors, unless you buy the super sims, uh, do not have ball bearings. All of our uh, brushless DC motors do have ball bearings, which makes them a little bit uh, freer spinning. But the major difference is the way that the power is applied to the um, uh, to the armature, or excuse me, to the um, uh, electromagnets. Again, because of the nature of the on-off condition of the commutator, you get very unhealthy spikes and a bunch of other things that happen electrically, which cause it to be less efficient um, transfer. The Falcon 500 and the Neo both use what's called sinusoidal um, power into the um, into their coils, which makes them very very efficient. Almost zero ripple in um, in torque. In other words, the, the the flux stays constant, torque stays constant, so it, it ends up they're much more efficient, which is good news. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, um, but there's more things we should understand, and and um, and so uh, if for those people who this is way too basic. I apologize, but the bottom line is that most of my undergrad students still need a refresher on this, so here we go. <laughs> First off, you need to understand the huge differences between torque and power. Uh, torque is, 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 is twisting effort, and so really, if you have a robot that's got to do something hard at the end, the end of an arm, or, or it's got to push hard, it's got to push the force on the circumference of the wheel, that requires torque. And the key thing to understand is that any motor that you can use in FRC has unlimited torque if you're willing to gear it down to the point where you can develop that. There is unlimited amount of torque. So that should tell you right now that you should never determine which motor you want based upon how much torque it produces. Because I can get as much torque as I want from any motor if I gear it properly. Now, power is the other bit. Power is the rate of doing work. And so if you're talking about how fast something must happen, how fast you want to climb, how fast you want to go up a hill, um, how fast you want to do lots of things, this requires power. And power is intrinsic to the motor. You cannot wish to produce more power than it can because that's it. You cannot multiply power by gearing ever. Um, and in fact, uh, as you'll see in the, in the bottom slide, the only thing that a transmission will ever do power-wise to any motor is slightly decrease it. The power, every time you put a transmission on any motor, the power goes down, sometimes by a huge amount. If you're using a very inefficient gearing, for example, uh, a worm gear drive, then you could lose over half of your power through that one transmission. So please understand that uh, it's not intuitive, but, but uh, if you have a very low gear uh, on a drive line, it doesn't make the robot more powerful. It makes it more forceful. You have more torque. Okay, so with that, let's continue on here. And by the way, uh, if anybody has ever taken an undergraduate course with Ken, if you <laughs> if you mess those two up, you Whoa. will get that full discussion uh, any number of times that is required to make that not happen anymore. Yeah, there <laughs> a, a few years ago there was a GM uh, truck advertisement on television where it, it just went out and it was showing these big trucks pulling all these um, trailers and said, oh, and torque is power. I said, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> well, you can get away with anything, anything if you're paying not enough by the minute for uh, advertising, I guess. But yep. so it is important to understand um, the parameters of any motor because, frankly, this whole reason for me talking about this is so you'll be able to understand what motor you should be using for what application. So you need to know what the motor basically has. And... Unfortunately, manufacturers in the past have often kind of disguised that with uh, hype. Um, I mean, oh, a 10,000 RPM motor that produces 500 watts. Well, the, the, the one thing you'd have to understand is that if they say those are limits, then I guarantee that it can't do both. In other words, it could do 10,000 RPM, but it will not be producing 500 watts there. So it's important to understand that. So let's go through some of that stuff. First off, um, 
I was intrigued enough by this uh, a dozen years ago that, that I was trying to challenge some of the manufacturer's data. And you'll discover later on in this presentation that there's still data right now that's off by a factor of two that's published by one of our main suppliers. No names, but... Uh, and, uh, but the bottom line is that you can test these. If you have any kind of equipment, um, lab equipment, even some simple lab equipment, you can test some of the motors pretty well. Because all you need to really understand whether it is a brushless or brushed motor are four parameters. And those are simply, if I know what it op how it operates when it's under no load, the two parameters, how much current is taken, which is a measure of the windage inside, it's a measure of the bearing drag, it's a measure of the brush drag if that exists, those are fixed losses. And if I know how fast it goes, I need those two items. And then I, then when I when I load it up to the point where it can't go anymore, in other words, when it's stalled, if I can measure instantaneously how much torque it produced and what its current draw at that point is, then I know everything I need to know about the motor. And if we have time, I'll be glad to go through some uh, spreadsheet information here to, to demonstrate how that can be used. I, uh, you know, Again, a dozen years ago, I was investigating this motor. It's a lovely motor. I so wish that they would let us use it again. Maybe they will at some point. But it's those of you who recognize it, we just call it the Van Door motor. There were several man, there were several different manufacturers of it. It's a very useful sized motor, a um, bit heavy, a worm gear motor. But that's the motor we're gonna, that I tested. And so to give you an example of here, this motor is small enough and, and uh, convenient enough that I could just clamp it into a vise and, and calibrate it this way. And so I, I just... I just timed it. We, um, uh, my colleague Brad Miller and I got into the lab and we and we bolted it down, applied 12 volts through a regulated power supply, and just sat there and counted how fast it was turning. Got that RPM down exactly. And then we put a big old arm on there and clamped it onto the shaft with a spring scale on there and measured how much force at a certain distance, and we got the stall torque that way. So here's the things we measured right here. 360 inch pounds, which is a significant amount of torque coming out of a gear motor. This is obviously a worm gear motor, so it's low speed with very high torque. Uh, so we got that, and then I said, well, that's kind of cool. Now, what can we do with that? So then I um, started thinking about this, and, and I developed this um, Excel spreadsheet. And, and you'll see it, uh, versions of it around in several places. Now, I don't know how it got places, but I, I've noticed that um, Vex and a few other people are using uh, this spreadsheet now. Um, this, not for the Van Door, but this style, which I've produced. Anyway, so you can see that the items there in green are the only items that I actually measured, but then I can predict every bit of it, including the maximum power. And, uh, and so this was actual data that I did collect. I only collected those four items, but then I can, I can follow the theory enough to predict everything else. And, and you, if you want my spreadsheet, you can get it, and in all the formulas are in there, and you can see how it works out. But you see this particular motor is about not quite 50% efficient at its max, and it produces about 50 watts. It was really quite a useful motor, and 48 RPM, as you can see. So this data is very useful for, um, for doing analysis, which we can do later on, but it's more interesting, perhaps, to understand the relationship between all these characters. So to do that, we plot on a graph. You'll come up with something which might hurt your head, but it really gives you a great understanding of, of how motors work. And every time I'm saying motors, by the way, it's brushed or brushless. They operate the same, surprisingly. So first off, the speed of any motor. Speed of any DC motor goes up with reduced load. Makes sense. And it's very linear. So um, obviously, if you go to the maximum torque on the right side of this curve, this, you stall the motor, which is zero RPM. And if you go to the left side, then you're, you take all the load off of it, and it's going as fast as it, as it could. In this case, I think it's 47 and a half RPM. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, a straight line, um, a straight line uh, association. So in the case of a manufacturer who says, I've got a 10,000 RPM motor that produces 500 watts, if, if, the uh, uh, 10,000 is the maximum speed, then I guarantee it doesn't produce maximum power at that point. In fact, we'll talk about that a little bit later. OK, so here is what happens with the current that is being um, absorbed into the motor. Um, as you might suspect, as we go to the right on this curve, as the torque increases, the load in the motor increases, it draws more and more current because by physics, current is what causes electromagnetic force. Electromagnetic force is force at the edge of the armature. Armature times the radius, that force times the radius of the armature develops torque. And so it's a linear relationship. 
you double the torque, you, you, it requires twice as much current to do that. Now, the only reason why it doesn't go down to zero at the bottom is that even when there is no external load on the motor, it takes a bit of current just to overcome all those things we talked about before, the drag, the windage, um, just the resistance of the motor spinning at high speed. So that's the reason why it doesn't quite go down to zero, but it always does follow a linear curve between um, the torque and, and the uh, current. Okay, now this is the one that is most interesting and, and kind of most um, indicative if you really understand how motors work. This is the amount of power it produces. Now, it's, you may wonder about this. Why, when I'm producing all this great amount of torque on the far right side, why don't I develop any power? Well, power is torque times RPM. And when the RPM goes to zero, which it is, when the motor is stalled to the far right, then there is zero mechanical power being produced. On the far left, it's got all sorts of RPM that's spinning crazily at, well, in this case, not too crazy, 47 RPM. But how much load is being absorbed? And the answer is zero. So it's all speed and no load, which also is zero power. And so curiously enough, you'll find out that the maximum power on any DC motor, and the maximum theoretical power, occurs when the motor's at half of its rated maximum RPM. Kind of interesting about that. Now, there's one last thing I want to put on here, and that's the efficiency. How much, what percentage of the uh, electrical power actually goes into mechanical power? Now, here's, here's another curve, which is kind of interesting. And notice skewed here to the high speed, low torque condition. The maximum efficiency on motors is not when it produces maximum power, but it's when it's on the high side of maximum power. In other words, when the motor is running faster than what it would take to make maximum power. Maximum power on this motor occurs at about 23 RPM. However, the maximum efficiency is about 38 RPM. And so that's traditional. Almost all, uh, I mean, all, not almost all DC motors will operate this way. The maximum efficiency point will always be higher RPM and lower power than the peak. Um, and, but, and of course, the reason why the efficiency is at zero at both ends is because you still have electrical power coming in there, but you have no mechanical. Okay, and there's one final curve I can throw in just for kicks, and that's the amount of, of, res, uh, of excess heat that's coming on. And you'll see this one here. The heating just goes off this chart crazy because uh, by the time you're at the, uh, the max torque, uh, you would be at, uh, looks like in this case, about 24 um, uh, amps at 12 volts, so you're about 480 watts, which is eight times the scale of this vertical scale on this chart. And so you can see that even though it only makes a maximum of 50 watts of mechanical power, it would make about 480 watts of heating power. It's a confusing chart. I, I, I agree with that, but it's really lovely once you understand it. So, so, at, so four, at 480 watts, that, that makes it a pretty good heater at that point, right? Well, I think so. I would think that, uh, you know, most of the uh, the little, um, uh, what they call the little kitchens that people used to buy, little, you know, the, my, I remember when my oh, daughter's- Oh, like Easy Bake Oven uh, or whatever? Little, little baby oven. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, have, they typically have a, like a 60-watt bulb, and they cook cookies with them. So 480 watts, yeah, it's sizable. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, that's good. Okay. And by the way, when you see charts like this, it's really important to note that they're not for multiple voltages. These are for- this is the way the motor performs if it is under a rigid, um, controlled, uh, full volt, in this case, uh, 12 volts. And so um, this does not reflect what happens when you move your, your, um, your joysticks to control the voltage coming into them. And we can talk about that a little bit later, but, uh, but this is full, full voltage. Okay, so, so just, just to conclude what we saw on the chart, and just, we already talked about this, but the maximum torque will always occur at zero RPM, uh, which is a real convenience for for robotic operations, normally you, you, you want to accelerate quickly, you want to start from someplace, you, you hate to have to slip a clutch to get things moving. And it's unlike any uh, combustive engine. You know, for example, um, a diesel or a gas engine produces zero torque at zero RPM, it won't run. And so electric motors operate much more like steam engines. Steam engines like on a train, uh, the old trains, uh, they also produce their maximum torque at zero RPM. Um, you know, and I might as well say this right now, but we're not going to talk about it. That, uh, you will find that uh, every modern electric car, Tesla, all the rest of those, even though they're powered by a DC source, 
all use AC motors now, which is kind of curious. Uh, the very first electric cars that came out um, were all DC motors because it was easy. But now the electronics have gotten to the point where we can convert um, DC to AC. They all are using AC now. And, um, and they've done some clever things with those motors. AC motors do not behave like DC motors. Most AC motors do not produce much current, much torque at zero RPM. But the ones they use for cars do have the same kind of a maximum torque condition at, at zero RPM. OK, so back to uh, FRC motors. You'll also notice that at zero RPM, it produces zero mechanical power and has maximum thermal power. And, and if you have a lightweight motor, which is fan cooled, they will smoke in just seconds. And by smoke, I mean overheat to the point where there literally is smoking, smoke that comes out of them, which is actually the burnt varnish on the wires that insulate each other in the uh, armature. Um, and so those will smoke and you're, you're finished. One aside here too, is that you'll often hear these motors referred to as air-cooled motors. I used to do that myself. But I challenge you to think about how does a SIM motor get cooled? The SIM is the big black motor there that that um, that's used to be used for almost everybody's driveline. There's no opening out of the motor. They're sealed motors. There is no fan inside. So how do they get cooled? Well, they get cooled by air, air coming around the outside. So every motor which is legal to have in FRC is an air-cooled motor. Some are fan cooled, which means they have internal ventilation, forced internal ventilation. Others are not. And so um, when I say fan cooled, a lot of people will say air cooled, but, but you will now know better because unless you have a water cooled motors, again, like almost all of the cars do now because the Teslas and all this have water cooled uh, motors, then all the motors we have here are, are air cooled. So, and, and what France was, was applying to, if you were to, if you were to, apply full current to a stalled SIM motor, it produces about 1,400 watts of power, which is the same as a hairdryer. Holy cow. And so that, that's big. And if you ever looked at a hairdryer and, you, and you, you block the air so it can't get the fan going through, you'll see red hot elements in there because it, it, that's what's inside your motor could look like. And by the way, for those of us in the old days that had cigarette lighters in cars, um, they only operate on about 400 watts, and they are red hot, ready to light up a cigarette or whatever else you're lighting up in seconds. And so there's a lot of energy going into a stalled motor. You should be very careful about that. So uh, really quick, Ken. So yep. I've, I've like touched lots of motors that have come off of robots, and they've been warm yep. or, or what have yep. you, but I've never really gotten burned off of yep. one from – or like, like a sim, for example. Yeah. Why, yeah. why well, is that if they make that much heat? Well, well, well first off uh, – Sims have an amazing amount of thermal mass. They have very large aluminum end plates, and the end plates is where they, they try to get the energy out to that. And they also have a very significant, um, just the casing and stuff, it's, it's got a lot of thermal mass. But, 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 but uh, you know, I haven't measured this exactly, uh, and Sims are very, very robust. I mean, it's, I've, I don't believe that I've ever successfully burned one that, but I've gotten hot <laughs> to the point where you don't want to touch them very long. If you if you can imagine that the the sim is hot to the touch, say uh, say 120 degrees to the touch, that means that it, it and it's already transferred through about an eighth of an inch of steel there, which it, there's some losses through there. It has to go through the electromagnets also to get through there, and then it has the air gap that has to go through from the the spinning armature, and then then the armature has got uh, an iron core sur surrounded by the wires. The wires are what are getting hot. Oh, okay. So by the time they get hot to the point where they're transmitting through all this tortuous path to the part you feel, oh, you're probably hundreds and hundreds of degrees inside of there. And, um, and so the, the nature of, of, of electromagnets is that they're not insulated with uh, typical insulation. They're just covered with a varnish that's a high temperature varnish. Um, and that's what keeps them from shorting out to each other. And once that gets hot, it melts, and then you get that that uh, Fisher Price smell in the morning. Ah, oh, yes. You know, the, the burned up uh, uh, fan cool motors, they, they'll let the smoke out right away. You don't smell the smoke inside a, of a um, sim because it's sealed. But but the, the, the bottom line, Francis, if you can feel any warmth on the outside of a big motor like a sim, you know it's bloody hot inside. And it also, it took a long time for that coolness, I mean, that heat to get to the outside. It takes just as long to absorb the energy. So in other words, you can cool off the outside 
as much as you want to, it takes a long time for the part that's hot to get to see that um, that energy change because it's it's still insulated from the coldness. It's 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 a tough situation. Wow, cool. Thanks. You betcha. Okay, so a little bit more on motors here, just just, just to really in, hammer this in is that um, the maximum power will always occur at one half of the stall torque, and so this is this is a truism. It's really quite nice, and and it's going to be approximately half the stall current, not quite because of the residual current that re is required to keep it running even when there's no load on, and will always be at, at at exactly one half the free running speed. Now, when I say exactly, these are all theoretical things which will come out very, very close. Um, and 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 I'll, I'll step aside a little bit and say that um, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about maximum performance. Now, you can tune a brushless uh, DC motor so it produces suboptimal um, uh, performance. In other words, you may not want to have a, uh, a motor that continually produces more and more torque as it slows down. Maybe you want a constant torque. You can tune a uh, a brushless DC motor so it doesn't develop its full torque, and you can hold at some constant. Uh, this is one of the advantages of brushless, but do not think you're ever getting something for, for nothing, because the only way you can, can hold something constant in a brushless DC motor is by reducing its performance when it would normally be increasing. You, you can't force something to go higher than the theoretical amount, but you can hold it down by delaying the um, the current through its armature and, and things like this. So, um, so when we talk about this slide, we're talking about full performance of any motor, whether it's brushless or um, or brushed. And and notice that because the power maximum power is an inverted parabola, there will always be two different points that produce the same power. Uh, you, you you have one side which is going to be at a very high speed and consequently low torque, and then the other side is going to be a lower speed and much higher torque. And you multiply those two together to come up with the same number. Um, and then just a little bit here again too that that the maximum efficiency occurs uh, uh, at at a very small portion of its maximum load. The stall torque is its maximum load, but it'll it'll occur somewhere around you know one sixth uh, of that maximum torque is when it it's reaches maximum efficiency, which will also be somewhere between you know, uh, 25 and 50% of its maximum power. It will never be at max power and max efficiency at the same time. OK, so I, this slide uh, represents uh, some old school robots, but some uh, old school motors, but some of these are, are current too. Um, we, we've already talked a little bit about brushed versus um, brushless DC motors. Um, and again, we'll talk a little bit more uh, later on about uh, when, where you supply which for, for those. Um, and then uh, the other two categories are, are uh, well, another category, by the way, is sealed versus fan cool. Um, all these, the top two motors on the right are sealed. The ones on the bottom are all sealed. Actually, the one on the very far right on the bottom is not sealed. Um, but, but sealed motors are normally used in, in applications which are designed for exterior. Um, uh, they're almost... I think every every automotive uh, motor, whether it's power window, uh, power doors, power um, seats, will always be sealed because you can't have water spray us up and mess them up with them. Um, and then the most what they call toy robots are robots that are designed for low cost and high performance and lightweight will be fan cooled. Um, and those are like two examples on the right there. You'll see openings in their cases, um, and that's where the air uh, goes out. And and generally speaking. They have much higher power density than the sealed ones because they can get rid of that extra energy. And brushless DC motors can either be sealed or fan cooled. Uh, they're, they're traditionally, um, when you have an outrunner and uh, the armature is exposed, that operates as a centrifugal fan. And so you do get a lot of air uh, traveling through all the parts of that. Every automotive motor also has built in thermal protection. These motors on the bottom are all automotive motors, one on the far right on the bottom, on the bottom slide there. Uh, and so they can gracefully degrade without smoking. Uh, what happens is that um, there is a positive thermal resistor inside in series with the armature. And when it senses too much current, it starts heating up. And that causes increased resistance when this shuts down the, um, the voltage coming to the uh, armature. Uh, that's the good news. The good news is that they won't blow up on you and burn up. But the bad news is, is that that takes a very long time to recover. Um, another characteristic, which is sometimes uh, valuable for you as from a designer point of view, is whether or not it's going to be um, 
has characteristics of anti back drive or at least back drive resistance. And, and not just, just to make sure we understand this, it doesn't mean the motor can't reverse because all these motors can go forward or reverse. The difference meaning is that if, it's, if it has no back drive resistance, then uh, not only can it go in, in reverse when it's powered, but it can also be driven in reverse by like pushing the robot backwards, your motor spins backwards. If you had a anti-back drive motor, then it would it could be powered forward and backward, but if you pushed it, it would move. And so, for example, on uh, wheelchairs, powered wheelchairs, they almost always use anti-back drive motors for the powered wheelchairs because if you run out of power and you're on a hill, they don't want it coasting down the hill. It would come to a stop. Um, and automotive reasons, obviously, obviously, too, if you had a power window motor that you could just put your hands on the window and pull it down when the motor was turned off, that would not be very good for security. <laughs> so those are also, they're, they're, they're not uh, going to be able to uh, do back drive. Okay, so let's look about these and see where we use these things. Okay. You know, I, I, I do a lot of undergraduate projects um, for uh, both mechanical engineers and robotics engineers. And I'm doing a couple right now. And, um, and, and our, our WPI folks are really good at, at understanding how to build mechanisms and all this. Uh, but our, our, uh, our students aren't particularly good, unless they've been through my classes, about how to know what motor to select. And people say, well, I want this motor because uh, it's got the right amount of torque. And as soon as they tell me that, I say, oh, you need to rethink that. There is one overriding criteria you must decide upon every time you put a motor in, and that has got to be this. If you have not figured out how much power you need, then you're guessing at what kind of motor you're going to put in there. Um, and so understand, this is the one thing you cannot change. Uh, you can change most other things, but you cannot change the amount of power that a motor can produce, the maximum power. So that should be your number one criteria. Second criteria probably is going to be the weight. And when you think about the weight of a motor, it's important to understand that it has to be the system weight. Um, some motors, like the worm gear motors, seem to be very heavy for the amount of power. But on the other hand, if you had to get a transmission attached to a high-speed motor that was much lighter, it could easily weigh as much. And so you have to make sure that when you consider the weight of the, of the motor and the transmission, you, you conclude not only the power you have, but now you have the torque and the speed you need, which, which requires a transmission normally, which we'll talk about later this afternoon. Um, and so that's normally the second most important thing because virtually everything in, in, in first involves um, weight control or, or limits of some sort. Uh, the next thing that, that I would use is say, um, how, much, how much landscape does this take? How much space does this, this motor take? I mean, this is one big advantage, again, of worm gear motors is that they get dramatic reductions uh, in a very, very compact package. The same way with, um, with planetary gear sets. There's ways of getting that very, very compact. But sometimes you simply have to put a motor because it has to fit somewhere. And so it has to be physically very small. And, and that can often be uh, a driver for you. You know, this next one, I just added today because I realized that uh, <laughs> you really have to think about this. Uh, and in fact, I, I've done a little analysis, hopefully we'll get to it today, which, which talks about the real net cost of all the motors you need to have. Uh, and you can't be misled just, oh, that's a $120 motor or $140 motor versus a $10 motor because sometimes motors require a lot of other expensive stuff to make them work. Sometimes they don't. But obviously, you need to do this. If you had everything else the same, I'd, I'd pick a motor that would cost less. Um, the back drive characteristics are kind of a consideration, but understand that if you really need to have a system that will not back drive, there's ways of doing it without using a back drive, an anti-back drive motor. You can make clutches. You can put um, brakes on it. There's other ways of doing that, but it's convenient if you can do it. Um, you need to understand whether this motor is going to be subject to continuous high loads or just intermittent high loads. Some motors are very tolerant of, of uh, high loads for short periods of time. They don't have much thermal mass, but they can handle it for a short period of time, but they can't handle it for an extended period of time. So you, gotta be, you have to concern yourself with that too. If you have something which only has to operate for like two or three seconds uh, at the end of a match, it doesn't need to be nearly as robust, something that has to be driving for two and a half minutes. And finally, um, if, well, not finally, but, but if I, everything else was equal, I'd say, well, let's pick the one that's most efficient because very seldom do you say, you know, this is a great motor for this application, but I wish it used more of my battery. No one says that. And so uh, having a more efficient uh, system is, is better. And finally, the very last thing, if you've gone through all this stuff is, what do you have left?
then you use whatever motor you have. And, and I must admit, in FRC one night, at, at times we said, oh, we got this motor left. Well, it's not ideal, but we can use it. And so, but, but please remember that the power is the, is the key feature there. Now, here's the specific recommendations. Um, you know, uh, for uh, brushless motors, uh, and I'm talking only about the Neo and the Falcon because I, I put the, um, the Nivec Dynamo in a different category, uh, novelty category. <laughs> <laughs> I think most, of, really... most people in FRC would agree with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I, this particular shot uh, is kind of rather interesting because it, it shows both the Falcon and the Neo, the new Neo 550 there. Um, and the Neo 550, by the way, um, uh, I haven't seen one up live, but it appears to be an outrunner with the fully um, um, uh, exposed uh, armature, or rotor, rather. Uh, I believe that's the case. Have you seen one, Francis? You know, I have, I have not. I, I only managed to get to a couple of events before things happen, so. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of a new motor, and it's actually quite an intriguing motor, because it's, and, and I like seeing in this application, because uh, people with swerve drive modules like this often make the mistake of underpowering their swerve. Um, it, yeah. and, and that causes a delay in the actions. And, and so um, the, the Neo 550 is a very strong motor for its application. And, and like the Falcon there, these are really good motors for um, high power, uh, really efficient use. And especially in swerve modules, the size of the motor is kind of important because it takes a lot of landscape where you might want to have something else operating. You can't leave the motors on your sides very easily. And so it, it, it having compact motors like a brushless uh, DC is quite good. Small form factor. Hey, Ken, so, just, just to let you know, someone from the chat, uh, Irwin1310, they're, they're saying that the Neo 550 is an outrunner with a spinning shell. Yeah, so. yeah, I, I thought it was. And so I'm, I'm particularly fond of that because that is the most efficient sort of, of uh, uh, brushless DC motor. Um, I mean, they, they cool much better. And, um, and if you look at the Neo, it's, it's uh, remarkably light even compared to the 550 remarkably lighter per power than its big brother is because the big brother like the Falcon has the uh, enclosed shell. Um, and so the other part, if not for a drive line, if you, if, you, if you have a high power application, which is high in the chassis, by all means use a brushless DC motor because um, every weight you have high is gonna make, is gonna be the decrement of, of stability and lots of other things you'd, you'd like to have in a robot. So those are conclusions about where to use those things. Uh, they are expensive. Now the big sealed motors, and this is an example I've shown there is a, is a sim. Um, they can handle, they're, they're, they're low RPM, which means they're kind of high torque, which means they need less gearing than some of the other motors. Although the brushless ones are fairly low RPM too, except for I think the 550 is fairly, fairly high speed, but um, uh, they're heavy and, and that can actually be a benefit if you keep it low in the chassis uh, for stability. Um, they also are very, very tolerant of, of sustained large loads. They have massive, amount of, of thermal uh, mass that can collect uh, energy and then uh, dissipate it over the periods between matches. Um, they're, they're, they used to be the only motor people used for, uh, for drive lines because they just work there. Um, but, but if you do use these, you, you need to make sure they stay low. I, I always find it very sad when I see one of these up high, like on a shooter, because they're way too heavy for the application and you can get uh, motors which are better for that high speed operation uh, than using these for that application. Um, now the worm gear motors, there aren't a lot right now, uh, have the snow uh, blower motor available and, uh, and there are a few uh, Denso window motors available. Um, these again have thermal protection, which is pretty cool. Uh, they are either back drive resistant or anti back drive, depending upon the helix angle in there, but they, they really easy to prevent from back driving because they don't like to back drive. Um, they, uh, they are low powered in general, not necessarily because they have small motors, but because they, they're only about, oh, 25 to 65% efficient because of the worm gear. But nonetheless, sometimes you just want something which is low speed and high torque, and this gives it to you in a very, very compact package. Uh, turrets, arm shoulders, keep them low in the chassis. Um, we actually uh, we actually use one for our uh, our balancing mechanism on our uh, 2020 robot this year, FRC190 did, because it was incredibly compact. And even though it's a fairly heavy motor for the, the window motor for snowmobile motor, window motor for is 20 watts, you don't have a transmission. It's just direct drag. It's nice and slow speed. And it was it was very uh, appropriate for that. And what was the name of that subsystem? The transversal something. I you know I I I I, uh, I believe that the uh, it was the uh, the abbreviation was T R D I believe. Oh I'm okay not sure yes. That, I'm okay. Not sure how that's pronounced. Uh, well, well we'll have to move on. Uh, we don't have time to yeah, talk right. about that I guess. So. <laughs> 
It could have been T U R D. I'm not sure now. Okay. Um, now let's give an example here of a um, of a of a uh, FRC 2020 uh, action that requires a motor. Let's just say hypothetically you want to lift, uh, build a winch to raise a 150 pound motor uh, three feet in two seconds. You know, you want to balance things. You want to do it quickly. So let's see how we do this and how we choose a motor for it. First off, you need to understand that again, remember the first choice is always to figure out the first criteria is how much power is required. So mechanical power is really easy when you're lifting. Something is simply going to be the amount of work that you're doing, divide by the time you're allowed to do it, and multiply by some conversion factors to move it into something that you are you can buy motors with. So in this case, the amount of power, the amount of work we're going to do is 150 foot pounds, 150 pounds times three feet, which is 450 foot pounds, and we want to do that in two seconds divide by two, and then multiply by my conversion factor. And, and those of you who have, are motor heads at heart like I am will recognize that 746 watts is exactly one horsepower, uh, which is also equivalent to 550 foot-pounds per second. So that's multiplying by a unit factor. And it comes up that we need 225 watts to do this operation that time. Now, if we look at our list of eligible uh, robot uh, motors, you'd find that in that in um, the 20 season, 2020 season, there were seven motors that produced um, that can produce at their limit. Uh, I mean, at their um, their circuit breaker limit, at least 225 watts. So these are the motors right here. These are the motors that will all do it. And you can see that the first two there are um, brushless, and then of course the 775 Pro amazingly puts out just a little bit more power than the SIM. Um, and there's reason for that. And there's that Neo 550. Uh, and then there's the other 775s that are there in a the 550, which is, uh, I always characterize it being smokable. I don't know if you've ever used these guys. Um, it's a very powerful motor, but boy, is it sensitive to any kind of stall condition. It, uh, it doesn't have much reserve on it when it gets hot. So here's what it can do at the limit. And, and I'm arbitrarily saying we're gonna, we put both these to all these to 40 amps. I think putting 40 amps to a 550 is, is risking it. But so we have all these motors and you can see that, that all these on the right side would work, um, except that the 225 that we came up with was actually a net figure. This was a perfect figure. This is a physics problem. There's always drag. There's always things you haven't accommodated, accommodated for. So it's good to always have a bit of reserve. Now. In FRC 190, we decide what the heck we haven't used the Falcons very much, but we decide what the heck we just go ahead and, and use one of those bad boys. Now that has a lot more power than we need, but nonetheless, it was light and we had a little bit of a weight problem this year, and so we decided to put that baby in there. And I would so, say that I would I would say that we were perfect with weight. <laughs> you, well, we weren't quite. We were, we were two tenths of a pound from being perfect. Oh, uh, true. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. But, uh, yeah. There's. A, I'm not sure there's an advantage to being at max weight. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the performance curve that was that's been published by uh, Vex, I believe, actually, and um, and and I will say right now that it looks kind of like mine, except that notice that the efficiency is on the right side rather than the left side, and things are kind of in inverted. And the reason why is that on the horizontal axis it's speed, not torque. Now I, I would have a bone to pick with uh, with people uh, uh, publishing data like this because um, there are two things that determine how a motor is going to operate. One is the voltage you apply to it, and two is the load that's applied to it. And so the, um, the, uh, the independent variable should be the torque. And so I would, I would do it differently. But nonetheless, you can see that it has the same sorts of shapes. And so we need 225 watts. You notice it occurs in two positions there on the chart one at the high RPM near 6,000 RPM and one down there like about 500 RPM. Okay, so we have two different choices here. Now we look at the uh, one on the left side here and say, oh, it's only 8% efficient at that point. Wow. So in other words, for me to produce uh, 225 watts of mechanical power, I'd be putting out about 12 times that amount of heating. And so that doesn't seem too smart. On the other hand, at the same power, the other one is at its peak efficiency of 88%. It's taking one eleventh amount of power to do the same mechanical power. Quite astonishing. So this is where you as a designer tell your robot, tell, explain to the robot how it's going to work. And you do that by determining its load. Remember, motors, 
don't operate by their good nature. They operate only when you have given it a certain amount of voltage and then you have imposed a certain load upon it. Now, if I was to operate on the left side here, that means I could impose a load of 36 inch pounds. If I put that, if I made it do that much work, then it would automatically be down there at that left side. On the other hand, if I decide that I'm going to change so it doesn't have as much load, for example, 2.8 inch pounds, then it would operate on the right side. Now, those are dramatically different. Now, Ken, Ken really quick, yes. Um, yes. on the on the left side, if you yes. were using that side and you were you were putting out uh, 225 watts of power, but yes. but having you know huge amount of heat. Yes. What that means the current is way 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 high, right? Well, in this case, you look at it, you find the current is about two hundred and thirty amps, which is of course you can't tolerate. <laughs> yeah, so you would you would trip your breaker immediately, right? Absolutely, which segues me perfectly to this this bit here. Remember, uh -huh. we have a forty amp limit based upon FRC rules, and uh, you know if you look at the data, uh, uh, Falcons have been run at. Um, uh, 80, 90 amps, um, and probably more successfully. But nonetheless, our rules say 40 amps, which means, boom, that's the only part of this curve you can use. And you notice that it does peak out at about 400 watts, which is a lot of power. But you can never get to that 780 watts because that would require, um, you know, somewhere, and this looks like about 100 and uh, maybe about 120 amps. And uh, not only would that... Uh, uh, be illegal to have uh, that wired that way, but it would also be the total sum of the entire current that the uh, battery is allowed to produce for any, any point of time with 120 amp breaker on the overall system, which meant if you had multiple motors doing this, yeah, you're not going to do it. So the other, the left side in this case is kind of interesting academically, but understand, and you could force the motor to try to get there, but it wouldn't because it's going to be limited to 40 amps. So in this case, we only can operate on the right side of the motor. Nice segue, Francis. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so so, so, uh, so here's what we 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 came up from this this uh, concluding on this is that uh, we have these two different choices where it makes the same amount of power, and here's the difference in efficiency, and it's it's notable factor of eleven. So our chore as a designer is to make the motor operate where we want it to. And that means we have to design a transmission and a winch drum radius such that it require that it will develop the 150 pounds, which is required to lift the robot up but only require 2.8 inch pounds of torque from the motor. If we require any more than that, then it will be sliding to the left of that curve, okay? So, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here because uh, we did some work on this and decided, oh, we're gonna use a two-stage spur gear transmission and being FRC 190, we normally make our transmissions. And so we made this one and uh, we're optimistically saying it's 90% efficient. Um, and that was with a two-stage eight-tooth uh, pinion on the uh, on the Falcon to a 70, and then a 16-tooth on to another 70. And which, if you multiply it out, and we'll talk about gear trains a little later, that comes out to be a gear train ratio of 0 0.026. And so that's kind of cool. So what you do with that is that you would then take your motor, your desired motor uh, input, which is 2.8, uh, divided by that, which is going to result in how much torque now the how much torque multiplication there is. Reduce that by the um, by the efficiency of the of the transmission, and you'd find out that that 2.6 inch pounds from the Falcon will deliver 97 inch pounds at the output of the transmission. Very useful to know. Now, that was arbitrary in our case, but it was it were they were gears that we had and gears that fit into the box, and so we were kind of constrained to use that um, that uh, transmission. So now we had to pick a winch drum diameter that would, um, a radius that would do this. And so what we need to do now is figure out if I have 97 inch pounds of torque at the axle of a, of a, of a drum, and I'm going to wrap up a cable on this thing. If I divide that by the 150 pounds of force I want, then that'll give me the radius that I need to have. And so this is what it looks like. We, uh, um, we have to lift 150 pound robot, which means we have 150 pound cable up there. That's the output coming from the transmission of 97. And so, um, you know, force times radius is, is torque. And so that means we used about an inch and a quarter diameter. Um, actually, we used exactly an inch and a quarter diameter a drum for our, our pulley. So that's pretty simple. And it, but if we'd use something other than that, uh, let's say, for example, what if we use a larger, a larger drum than 1.3? Maybe we, we found a two inch diameter thing we're going to use. What would that happen? Is there anything to think about that? Would the, would the robot climb faster or slower? 
Well, the truth of the matter is you would actually climb faster in this case, because remember, if we go back, if we go back to this, uh, this, this bit right here, you would see that, uh, can you see my, you can see my cursor, can't you, Francis? Uh, no, no, we can't. Oh, you can't? Okay. No. Okay. So if, if you were to, um, uh, look on the right side and you can see the 2.8 inch pounds, uh, there. And if we decide we want, we, we have more torque on that, then the torque would go vertically up. Uh, on the right side, you can see the torque goes up as it go up there, which means that the power goes up as well. And so the power is on the upward climb, which means that if we apply more torque, it would eventually, uh, it would actually produce more power, which means it would climb faster. Now, that only would exist until a certain point. It would climb faster, but the motor would start to get increasingly hot because the further we get up that slope, the less efficient the motor becomes and the more heat, uh, more energy is being converted to heat. Now, when we get to 2.8 inch diameter, the motor would reach its 40 amp current limit, which means that uh, in the long term, that's it. We would never design the motor to do that because we would hate to have the circuit breaker pop as we're doing our climb. And so it really means we can no longer climb. So if you think about this, here's our, our design matrix. If we made it the diameter we wanted, which is 1.3, the motor condition would be, I'm working really easy, I'm high, high efficiency, and it would take the two seconds that I figured it was gonna climb. Okay, if I made it a little smaller than that, the motor is really happy. It's, it's doing less work. In fact, it's, it's, it's actually uh, operating with much less current. Um, it's going to be quite happy with that, but unfortunately, it's going to be making less power. So it means it's going to take more than two seconds. It's because, you know, now we're on the downward slope of that uh, power curve. And so it actually would take a little bit more than two seconds if we made it smaller than that. In other words, it's, it's easy work, but it's not spinning fast enough to make up for the reduced torque. If we made it larger than that, the motor starts getting hot. And, but it will go slightly faster than we intended because we're in a higher horsepower. But once we get above 2.8, it's going to be unhappy and start getting hot. And in fact, uh, basically, we're going to reach the circuit breaker limit, which means it's not going to climb anymore. Okay, so that's, these are things that you can control as a designer, um, and, uh, and so it's important to understand that. Okay, now here's a couple of design details that you should be thinking about as, you, as you're moving along. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's important not to ever have a, uh, uh, if you have a lifter or an arm or a winch that's holding something in position, it's important not to rely upon torque for any extended period of time, because when you're doing that, um, if the motor is stalled, which means all the power that's, that's coming into the motor to hold it in that position is going 100% to heat. In this previous example, if we use that uh, Falcon, it only takes 16 watts to hold it stationary if we use that small diameter, the 1.3. But if we were the maximum diameter, it would be five times as much heat now as going into, um, it just going into heat, which means now we're at that, that little um, oven, cookie oven uh, temperatures right now. So uh, any protracted period of time, you'd overheat that, that motor. Now there's ways around that. Oops. Right. So uh, the, to prevent to prevent motors from having to hold stalled condition, there's a couple ways of doing this. Uh, one is to build some sort of a of a one-way clutch, a mechanical uh, ratchet um, to hold a position, and the other is um, is to figure out some sort of a balance mechanism that is uh, uh, either through like constant force spring, something that holds it so it doesn't have to uh, to fight that that much. Um, I'm trying to remember, Francis. What did we use on our climber this year? We had a ratchet. That's right. Yes, we had, it was. It oh, was that's actually right, that's right. That's cause... right. We used the, we used the ratchet because we knew that um, we didn't want it to ever have to hold power. But also, if we lost power, we don't want it to sag. And nothing is sadder than to see uh, a rover doing its end motion and climbing and not quite get to the point where it has to lock. And, and it sags down when the power comes off. So um, a ratchet or a one-way brakes or, or a balancing mechanism is really a pretty good feature. Okay, um, some more conclusions here, uh, more uh, recommendations. If you are using fan cold motors, which are dirt cheap, like seven, 10, $15 a piece, they have incredibly high power to, for their weight. Uh, uh, and they're very expensive, but they're intolerant of any high torque. So you gotta be careful about them. They're, they're happiest when the fan is spinning fast. Now. Uh, again, from those who are mechanical engineers, you understand that uh, that the dynamics of of uh, fans, centrifugal fans, is such that uh, as you double the the rotation speed, you get four times the flow, and so it's it's kind of a uh, it goes up by the square of the speed. So when they're going fast, they're producing all sorts of airflow, and they really have amazing cooling. 
Ironically, when they're going fast is when they're most efficient also, which means they don't need much cooling. When they really need cooling desperately is when they're going slow, which at that point, the fan's doing nothing. So it's, it's an irony that the fan-cooled motors only work like they're supposed to if they're at high speed. At low speed, they won't help you at all. And, and so never use these things for things that, that have to go down to low speeds with high, high loads on them. We use them for shooters or fans, things that are constant high RPM. They'll, they'll last all day there and be really happy. OK, so a couple of general suggestions here. Always operate every motor, whether it's a, um, whether it's a brushless or brushed, on the high speed side of the performance map. You never want to go to the low speed on the other side of the uh, parabola because you're into that low efficiency, high heating condition. Um, fan cooled motors, uh, they're very, very useful, but they cannot operate uh, near stall for more than just a few seconds. Never fall into the trap of saying, you know, oh, well, we didn't quite gear up. We're just going to slow this operation down by reducing the voltage. This is, this is a designer's failing. And, and, if, and if I would evaluate the design, I'd say, oh my god, that's a fail. Because it means you didn't gear it properly initially. When you reduce the voltage in half by motor, you actually reduce its power by one quarter. Because uh, not only does the speed go up with the voltage, but also the torque. And so when you multiply those two together, it makes dramatic differences in the power when you have to control the speed of a motor. So you want, when you figure out the maximum speed, you want anything to do, whether it's driving or lifting, you want that to be at the faster the motor can turn, at full voltage. Uh, never, never do an electronic transmission uh, by reducing voltage because just it just makes things unhappy. Um, I talked about it before, but if you have to have something which holds the position, make sure it's not for very long. And if you have, if you have to have time, be sure you have something that prevents a uh, backdrive condition. It could be a worm gear motor, it could be a ratchet, it could be a brake. Um, a rule of thumb for drive lines, and I, I always get intrigued with this because I see these people with. Um, I, I used to see six SIM uh, drives, and now I'm seeing people with uh, uh, six um, Neo drives and six uh, Falcon drive motors. And I, I'm just, you know, the, the rule of thumb is that when you're in, when you're in your lowest gear, um, and if you if you drive against a wall, if you can spin all the wheels, then you're okay. If you cannot spin all the wheels, then you're too high geared. That means that the motor are stalled, and that means that they will stall in a, in a match. You, if you're pushing a contest, you want to be, your wheels to be spinning. You don't want them to be stalled. And so um, be careful about that. Always gear your, your system to the point where you have enough torque to break traction when you're in you, your drive gear. And if you have two speed, then make sure you're in your lower gear. But most people, I, I've never quite understood the reason for putting uh, as much power as people do into their power lines. Because once you've achieved the speed you want to travel and you've achieved the ability to spin the wheels, then there is no reason to go any more power. Um, understand that all I've talked about is ideal stuff. Real road motors in robots will not operate at the peak values predicted uh, because there, there are line losses. Your batteries will never be 12 volts. Uh, they're they're going to be sagging. Um, and in fact, uh, it's important if you have a very long arm with a motor at the very end of it to understand that there will be appreciable loss of voltage uh, throughout that um, the length of conductor. Uh, anecdotally, in 2008, we had uh, one uh, motor that uh, it was a Fisher Price motor, an air cooled motor that was that actually had to go through, I believe, about 12 feet of uh, of a coiled wire to it, and we found out we lost a volt and a half by doing that. Be sure when you figure out your motor requirements, when you figure out power, that you also understand that net power and the power you really need to operate is somewhat different because there'll be losses associated with every mechanism, whether they're bearing losses or, or whatever. There's always additional losses, so always that a factor of safety. When you look at reference data for, um, um, for motors, be sure it's, it's, it's correlated to the voltage you plan on using, 12 volts. Uh, a lot of uh, automotive motors, which are designed to operate when the ignition is off, um, and like door openers and window openers, are actually sometimes uh, their data is at 10.5 volts, which is what they consider the minimum voltage that a car should have in order to operate things. So be careful about that. Um, now, I got some time here. I can talk about transmission, but Francis, tell me how many we do time talk about transmission a little bit or not. Yeah, we can talk about it. Right now, uh, we've got about uh, 20, 25 minutes or so. Okay. Um, and we got a few questions too, so go on ahead. Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, this is this is interesting. Yeah. So uh, unless you're, you're going to have to have a transmission, and so here's things that transmissions can do. They they can modify the output speed or torque. 
They can change the direction of rotation. And you can use them to physically separate the motor from the device. Obviously, this is what chains do. If you want to chain drive your, your bits together. Uh, and of course, uh, as we talked about in the, uh, in the example of the, uh, of the Falcon doing the lifting, we use a transmission to modify its torque to increase it. Um, OK, these are things it can do. There's one thing it always does. And those of you who are listening would know what I'm going to say. They will always reduce the power. It's a foot stomper. We're saying again that a transmission never increases power. It only marginally decreases the power to losses in a transmission. Okay. So now, oops, sorry about that. Okay. So, so just to understand a little bit about this, this, this should be a primer for some of you folks. Is that um, whether you're talking about gears or sprockets, then please don't make that that misnaming it. It really, it's it's to me, it's almost like the power and torque controversy. Um, most 10 speed bikes have no gears. They have sprockets. Sprockets drive chains or timing belts. Gears drive other gears. And so it's pretty clear. Okay, but, but it doesn't mean if we're using um, chain sprockets or gears, you just count the number of teeth and you can calculate all the, um, the gear ratios and the speed ratios that you need. And it's always, I use this figure here called E, which is a speed ratio. Um, and it's the product of the numbers of teeth on the drivers divided by the product of the numbers of teeth on the driven gears or sprockets. It's also equal exactly to the speed out of a transmission divided by the speed in, and, and it's equal also to the torque in divided by the torque out times the system efficiency. So those are kind of definitions here, and I'll give some examples here. Now, here's a, here's a two-stage transmission. It's got a, a, a spur gear uh, first stage and a sprocket second gauge. Uh, chain sprocket. And so you see that there are two driving elements. And these are the two that convert torque to force at the teeth. And then there are two elements which are driven elements. And these are ones which take the, forth, the force from the driver and convert it to torque to the shaft. And so those are the drivers. So all you have to do to find this, this ratio is simply to multiply all the drive, numbers of teeth on drivers together and divide by the number of teeth on driven, and that gives you that ratio. And what that really says is that the speed of this output will be 0.19 times the speed of the motor coming into it. Um, and so in this case, with a 5,000 RPM motor, which is what that little uh, sim was, um, that was baby sim, I think, or what that was, uh, you'd have about 1,000 RPM on the output, which was the ball collector, which is what we wanted. Now, in the same example, let's see what happens to the torque. The same the same transmission ratio, the same speed ratio of 0.19, but losses occur at every stage. And there are two stages. And so typically, if you have a well-designed system with the gears aligned and the, and the chain and sprockets aligned and lubricated, you'll lose about 5%. Uh, you'd be about 95% efficient through each stage. And so here are the two stages, the, 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 the spur gear stage and then the, um, the chain and sprocket stage. And so in this case, we calculated we needed 20 pounds at the edge of that roller to successfully pick up these balls to get to gather them off the ground. And so it was a two inch diameter roller. So we, we do some calculations here and say, okay, so that means the torque out of the final transmission has to be the 20 pounds times the one inch radius of that drum. So we need 20 inch pounds. And so we do this and work back through that, that same relationship that says we need to have then 4.2 inch pounds at the motor output. And that includes the, the change of, of torque through the uh, transmission plus the losses of the two stages there, the 0.95 squared there. And so uh, and this small sim is what we had here that, would, that could work there. That would, that would do that. It would, it would take 28 amps to operate that, that small sim. I know there's, there's a lot of um, move now uh, amongst a lot of teams to go with timing belts. Um, I rather like chains. <laughs> Um, I think that timing belts are, are excellent if you um, use a really good design methodology. Um, timing belts, uh, some people will say, are, can be more efficient. They certainly are at the end of a season when, when your chain's getting all rusted up and all that. Um, but, um, but, but chains uh, have a certain robust nature. And of course, the other big advantage of a chain is that uh, it doesn't, you don't have to make the commitment on the final design um, until you've built it. Uh, because you can change the length of the chain easily without having to order a new timing belt or if you decide to change their, your distance between your, your mechanisms. But anyway, so you should understand a few things about chains. Um, the first digit on, on, on chains is always the pitch, which is going to be in, the, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the width between each roller. 
And the second digit it has to do with whether or not it's a, actually got a bearing inside that roller if it's just a bushing. Uh, an example here is that um, FRC 190 uses an awful lot of 25 chain. A lot of people do. The downside is that it's hard to work with, uh, especially if you use mash links that are so small. Uh, but the good news is it's incredibly strong. You know, it's breaking strength of around 875 pounds. And I'll tell you right now, if you look in a lot of um, data sheets, you'll find out something like 140 pounds, 150 pounds. And just understand it's between breaking strength and working load. Uh, commercial chains are, 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 are designated in several different ways. Uh, working load means that it'd be safe to walk underneath this thing after it done like a, you know, 10 million cycles. Um, there, there's a huge factor of safety on that. Uh, and it also has to do with um, expected life and all of that. So um, when I design things, I do it uh, based upon the intrinsic strength, and then I apply factors of safety as necessary um, as I see prudent for its application. The number 35 chain, which some people use for drive lines, um, requires over a ton of force to break it. If you break a 35 chain, you've done something pretty unusual. So we, we generally, uh, I don't think we've used 35 chain, but maybe once or twice in, in uh, 28 years of, of FRC them. Um, some other things about chains. There's the minimum and maximum size uh, for the numbers of teeth you have on that. Um, and it really has to do with uh, the fact that, that sprockets are not true circles. They're actually uh, polygons are with the number of sides equal to the number of teeth. That's the way the chain sees it. So when you go to a very small tooth count, um, it's no longer a very accurate circle. And you get lots of vibrations and other things happening. And if you get longer than, uh, if you get a larger than about 75 tooth, then there's a very, very good chance that with nominal use, your chain will no longer fit all the teeth because the chain, they call it chain stretch. It's not really, it's chain wear. Um, but uh, you're allowed 2% before a chain is thrown away, which means that if you have 50 teeth in contact, suddenly it wants to fit 51 teeth at 2%. So that's what happens there. Make sure you have plenty of chain wrap on anything, 120 degrees minimum. Otherwise, it'll get that snap, snap. Um, uh, hearing that you hear when people have, have not put enough chain wrap and went under high torque, the chain skips. Um, be careful about um, making sure that you can avoid using half links if you, if, you, if you can. Half links are not as strong as a full link, which means that you should make adjustments in, in two pitch intervals so that you can avoid that. Um, here's what they are. You know, there, there's, there's a pitch and there's pressure angle. These are... Uh, Typically, um, uh, factory standards, um, you know, you have to look on the data sheet to see what they are. Um, the, uh, the number of teeth, it, th these are useful to know because it tells you how to make transmissions. If you know, if understand the pitch and the pitch diameters, then you can make your own custom transmissions, which is what we do all the time, and, and have no problems with them. At this point, it'd be interesting to talk one step back a little bit and, just, and talk about a problem with the, uh, that we discovered with the Falcons. Oh yeah, <laughs> the uh, 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 there is a special form of a of a gear that's made for opinions on the Falcon, and actually uh, they make it for other uh, Vex makes it for other ones too, which has got um, a non-standard pitch diameter. It's it's their eight tooth uh, that fits on a ten tooth pitch uh, diameter. Uh, it, it's not really tips. It does it it replaces a ten tooth without having to change the standard distances. So there's some weird things that happen there, and it's a pretty clever idea because it allows you to change the pinion gear without having to redesign your entire transmission. However, we discovered that um, that the particular eight tooth pinions that they make for the Falcon are not made exactly right, and the actually the outside diameter is slightly too large. And what we determined, we couldn't figure out why. We made a perfect transmission, but we felt as we turned the drive line, which is where I drive on a robot, we could feel a naughtiness. The, 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 it was just, there was a naughtiness in the transmission. And we looked at and looked at and discovered that actually the outer diameter, or no, excuse me, the inner diameter, the inner diameter of the eight tooth pinion is slightly undersized. So it's actually physically hitting the larger gear. Uh, and, and it was very noticeable. It was causing a major amount of vibration and pitchiness in, you know, uh, snappiness when you tried to operate the gears. And so we, uh, we, we analyzed that. And, and the easy way around it um, is to take the one gear that meshes with that, the one larger gear that meshes with that pinion, and put it on the lathe and turn down about, I think we turned down about four thousandths of an inch on the OD, uh, and it fit perfectly. So be careful about that. But there was a, there was a mistake in that. Yes, and, okay. and I believe uh, they posted about that a little bit on Chief Delphi as well. Did they really? Yeah, it, hmm. well, it was, 
I found out about it after we saw the problem yeah. happening. So yes, <laughs> but yeah. yes, it is. It is a known issue that hopefully they'll fix at some point in the future. But we'll see. Yeah, uh, and and as, as long as we're talking about the Falcon 500s, which which personally I think are, are wonderful motors, everybody should be aware that there were some issues with it initially. Um, you know, uh, we we luckily uh, discovered before we damaged any motors, but there were loose screws inside that you had to lock tight and tighten up. Um, there was uh, there's a problem with the spline having the uh, you know not really quite fitting the uh, uh, the pinions that fit on there. Um, but they were brand new motors, and I, and I know they've already uh, made some changes, some of that stuff. So um, I'm still convinced that they're a very, very excellent motor. Um, so anyway, there's, there's things on. I'm not going to talk much more about those gears. Just a couple things about gear sizes is that um, you don't want to go. Um, normally, you don't want to go smaller than, than 12 because you end up getting a very weak uh, pinion. Um, and again, um, you can buy them down as, as low as 8, but the 8 is especially designed with a, with a stronger than normal root. Um, but uh, it, it, good design practice says you shouldn't go really uh, below a 10. Um, and, um, and you can go to infinity. Infinity is, is, a, is a straight section of rack. It's hard to buy a gear with a full gear, which has an infinite number of teeth, a bit large. Uh, but the cool thing about it is that not only does the pitch have to be the same, but also the pressure angle has to be the same uh, for them to fit together. But then any of them will fit together. Uh, and so that's easily done. And if you want to make your own transmission, it shows you how to do it here. Um, it is really easy. You just simply do this math here and come up. And, and although I've heard some people actually um, will take these exact numbers and add a little bit to them, uh, I'm, not in that, I'm not in favor of doing that. I think that uh, I, uh, when I've made transmissions, I use just exactly those numbers, and, um, and I count on them being right. And with the exception of when gears are not made right, uh, they work. And they're actually very efficient. Just like the change, they can be um, 95 to 98% efficient per, per stage. Worm gears... Lovely things. Do not think that they are guaranteed to be anti-back drive. Some are just back drive resistant. Uh, the the uh, snow blower motor, for example, you can turn it, you can back drive it, but it doesn't, but it takes very little to hold it. So it's still pretty good there. But notice how inefficient they are. The efficiency from 25 to 75%. Um, that's because there's a lot of sliding friction as they, as they go back and forth. Uh, very compact though. And again, it's just so amazingly useful in very small uh, locations. Um, so again, uh, oh, I, this, I already did this one. This is the same stuff here. I think I'm up. <laughs> hey, I'm done. <laughs> uh, unless we want to talk about my uh, spreadsheets a little bit. Uh, yeah, we could take a, we could take a quick look at, at some of those. Yeah, if you want to. Put... Yeah, can I, can I, I would like to do that if I can. So, um, I, beg with me. I'm gonna dump this off here. Sure, go ahead. Go right, yeah, go right to the. Uh... Yeah, and while you're setting that up, I'll just let everybody who's watching know first off that. Um, Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I I love the changes that I, since I've seen it last uh, that you made for for um, uh, for brushless motors. Uh, I think yeah. that was I I learned some stuff about that. Um, yeah. Also, everybody who's watching, if you have any questions, go ahead and send them in right away so that we can make sure we uh, answer those in a couple of minutes. And also, if you're watching, uh, just a reminder that starting at six o'clock today, we're going to have uh, Jamie Luce from uh, first on to talk about the game design behind this past year's FRC game. So don't you, you want to stick around and watch that for sure, too. All right, so we've got the spreadsheet up here. Yeah, ben, so go ahead. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Is, this is my spreadsheet that, 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 that I produce every year that, that talks about the, uh, the motors that are available through um, the seasons. And then you'll see down here on the... I, don't, I mean, on, uh, can you see my cursor here? Uh, uh, no, we, we can't see the cursor, but if you click on the cell, we'll highlight it. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, at the bottom, you'll see that there's tabs here which have all the different motor specific data. But here's our, this is a conclusion, uh, are they, the, um, um, the summary sheets here on top. And I, I have them uh, listed from the top down from the most power to the, the lo lowest power. And I have just some pertinent data here. This is, only, this is only cursory information that's useful for kind of thinking, you know, what I should be looking at. And then notice the cost here. Um, now, notionally, I've said that we want to have all these motors perform the same way, which means we want to have complete control of them. Uh, and complete control, if you're going to use CAN and, and have motion tracking all that stuff, really implies that you're going to use something like a, uh, uh, an SRX. And so you'll notice, sillyly enough, I'm putting SRX controllers for every motor, even in the case of a 550, which only costs $7 a motor. But that's an appreciable expense you have to add if you're going to control a motor to the degree that you get from the uh, brushless motors. And so you see, even though the Falcon is $140, um, it's not much different than like the SIM because the, um, uh, the, the SIM, you have to add a $90 uh, controller 
uh, to get that same uh, that same uh, controllability. So um, don't let the $140 for a Falcon uh, drive you crazy because uh, you're saving the $90 or $75 for uh, a control because it's, it's built into that. Um, but also notice that the peak power has very little to do with the maximum power. I mean, in the case of the Falcon 500 particularly, because its peak power is, is almost twice what you can actually use because of the uh, 40 amp limitation. Um, so if you were to go into any of these, um, and uh, let's, for example, let's, let's look at that Falcon. If you look on this, well, let's see, yeah, that, that, that one's okay, I guess. Um, and, um, and so this is, the, um, this is the spreadsheet similar to the one that we saw um, um, when we saw it um, with the uh, the example motor that used that the Van Dorm. So in this case, you can see here's here's the the uh, speed, here's the torque coming out, and, and you can see that all the the performance there. The green highlight issues are ones that um, that you have to put into this system to for to to uh, to develop all this. Now, it's it's reference voltage is 12 volts. For example, if I decide I want, to, I don't know if you can see. Can you see me change this? Yes, we can. Okay, so if I change that to 10 volts, you'll see that everything changes now. And so now this means if I'm operating at 10 volts, you can see what the RPM is going to be, and you see the power has dropped off, and and, uh, and so you can change this with voltage to um, to whatever you whatever you want to do. This is a way you can make these things do. Um, um, oops, 160 volts would be a bit high. Um, and so you can you can uh, now here's a half voltage, and notice now a half voltage. It's only producing uh, about 200, um, uh, less than less than 200 watts, which was again, you know, the maximum peak before was about 780. So remember, this you've cut the you've cut the power the voltage in half. You've cut the power by by four and down to a quarter. So this is the reason why I say just you should never uh, control uh, your top speed under normal operations by uh, uh, by voltage control. The the one word I kind of wanted to highlight here um, that is that's a new motor which I really like. Is this little Johnson PLG motor, and the reason why I think it's really useful is that those of us who have been in the in the uh, business for a long time recognize how useful the Globe motor was. It really what it, it it was, and then when it was when it disappeared, there was nothing that really replaced it. Um, it's incredibly compact. It has a uh, two stage um, planetary gear on it, and it is in this convenient 50 watt range. Um, the problem with our, our motors we're allowed now, we have all sorts of motors which are in the 20 watts, you know, the window motors, the snowblower motors, all that kind of stuff. And then you go up to the 150 watt stuff like the bag motor, but there wasn't anything in between those things. And so this is a really useful motor down to 410 RPM, quite light because it has a transmission associated with it, you know, less than almost just about a half a pound. And I, I expect that, uh, you know, that this is something that I will be very, very pleased to see because it's so compact. You can use that at the end of arms. You can use it for risk control, a lot of things like that. So I'm, I'm really pretty happy about that. So uh, I wanted to highlight that motor. The, all the other motors are here. Um, the Neo 550 is another super good motor. I really like it too. Um, um, you know, high efficiency uh, and high power. Um, but going back to the summary here, if you ever wanted to build your own, if, if you wanted to make your own motors on here, you simply have to do like it says here. Um, you simply, like it says, a note four here at the bottom and in the middle here says, any new motor can be represented by copy and paste to a new tab and then inputting just the reference data and everything else pops in. And so you can, um, as, as if you get this spreadsheet and you're welcome, I don't know how we can distribute it, but you're welcome to take it. Um, then you simply need to uh, uh, build up a new tab uh, and copy and paste something, and then it'll it'll develop all of the data you want. So you can always be current with the the motors you need. That's great. So just for everybody watching, um, we're we're gonna talk. We're gonna get Ken's uh, stuff and make the spreadsheet available on some sort of we're gonna say some sort of shared. Uh, perhaps Google, perhaps not Google-based uh, platform with which we can uh, uh, share documents, either Google Drive or OneDrive. We'll have that for everybody to take a look at at some point. So. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'd be glad to answer any questions, uh, Francis, you might have. Yeah. All right. So we got our first question here coming from the chat. Uh, this one is from, uh, let's see, this guy's name is ZR Boyer 190 uh, <laughs> they, I wonder who that could be. I have no idea either. They're asking, um, how would you analytically solve for a motor's response time 
to a given signal for an application such as a flywheel shooter, but the amount of time <laughs> it takes to ramp up to speed is important to gameplay. Oh, boy. Uh, we'll give you the easy ones here. I know we, that's well, a, it's a pretty complicated frankly, question, but... The, the other thing about that is that, um, um, and it has... Uh, uh, as, as Zach commented, we, we did this calculation this year, and it's it's fairly interesting calculation. Um, let me just say a couple things about about shooters um, uh, since he's brought this up. Um, the, the the most I think the most important thing to do about shooters is to make sure that you plan overhead performance on the motor. In other words, um, what really happens with a speed controlled uh, shooter is that you have an encoder there which can tell you, okay, I need you know eight thousand RPM, and so. Um, and if it sees an error, then it's going to do. It's going to uh, make the um, the um, electronic speed control um, higher voltage, so it, it goes back up there. So what you want to have is a lot of overhead. In other words, um, if you have a motor which uh, you want to spend, say it's eight thousand RPM, you want, and your motor spins uh, naturally nine thousand RPM, um, you have very little left. In other words, you're on you're on the far uh, side of the high power low torque condition of the motor, which means that even when you apply full voltage, there's not much torque to accelerate it. And so uh, in general, if you want the fastest response time, you want the motor to be speed controlled somewhere in its meaty section, okay. somewhere where it can, it has a lot of, uh, in other words, you would like it to take maybe six volts to get to that speed so that you can apply 12 volts when it comes off and it'll zap up there right away. If, if it requires 11 volts, to get to your desired speed, two things will happen. Number one, at the end of the match, you may not even have 11 volts left, so it means you're not gonna have any chance to e ever climb. But even if you had a full 12 volts or 12 and a half volts, you only have like an extra volt and a half put on top, which means that the amount of net torque coming to the uh, acceleration is very small. So always plan your motors to be operating somewhere in about their middle, their middle operation and speed control to that. And remember, uh, uh, they also the max power will occur, you know, at at fifty percent of their RPM. So it's fifty percent RPM is not bad to be operating on if you want to have the ultimate amount of uh, of um, uh, quick response time. Now, the the entire thing is kind of interesting. It's kind of complicated. Uh, you know, if you have a multiple shot situation, then you need to understand how many seconds. Are you expecting the energy to come off of the off of the roller, and and of course the way you figure out the energy is simply saying, well, I'm assuming my ball is moving at nothing when it gets there, and I and I measure or I or I calculate how fast I want it to be moving, so you can take the momentum transfer to that, you know, knowing its mass and the velocity, and you'll know how much incremental energy is is taken from the system every time a ball goes through there. Now. If you know the rate that those balls come through there, now you know the energy per time, and that clearly is power. And so if you know that you want to shoot um, five balls a second and they have, and everyone's going to take off so many, um, uh, you know, so much energy, then you can calculate that all out, um, you know, calculate the energy per second, and that'll tell you, tell you how much power you need. Now, this is the motor you should put in there to produce that power. Now, remember, Going 10,000 RPM and holding and, and spinning up a big flywheel takes zero power because there's, I mean, just takes windage. There's no net power. So if you just decide, oh, this motor spins fast enough, I'll put it on there, and you don't consider the power, then you haven't done a good design. So I, I'm, I'm skirting around his question here because the actual, <laughs> the actual calculations are quite doable but they involve not only the response time on the motor, but also the response time on your processor, how long it takes for the, uh, uh, the encoders to recognize the, 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 you know, the polling time for it, recognize an error, how long it takes that error to get back to the speed controller. And, then, uh, and so these things can happen in, in you know, milliseconds, microseconds, but they're all tangible things. And then you can predict the amount of time you have to recover the energy. And so if you take the time between shots, subtract the time it takes for the reaction, the voltage to get to the motor, and then look at the time from the time that it gets from the time it gets to that point to the time it has to be the next ball to come up. That gives you the amount of time you have. And then you would divide that into the energy required to put back into the system. And that will do it. Now, the other thing I'll say about this is that there's a lot of controversy about flywheel size. You know? <laughs> Now, this is very interesting because, first off, the flywheel uh, levels out the, the, the velocity but doesn't change the energy one bit. 
the amount of energy that, that comes off of the system is identical whether you have a massive flywheel or a very small flywheel, which means that if you have a small flywheel, it means the speed goes down more, but the amount of energy it takes to recover is exactly the same. If you have a very large flywheel, then the speed changes very little, but you still have that same energy to put back into it. What that really means is that the size of the flywheel makes no difference on the amount of power it requires to operate this on a continuous basis. Because even though the speed may not have come off very much, it will never get back to there unless you put in the amount of energy in that time increment that you took out of there. Right. So, uh, and so, it, you know, be careful with flywheels because um, um, it's a lot of weight up high. Uh, we, we discovered that in, I think, 2012 with our robot that yes. was very, very <laughs> tippy. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and so, um, and, and the bottom line is that, do you really care if during one shot, the, the, the velocity goes down a bit? Do you really care? Because you simply calibrate it. You assume that it decreases the same amount every time it hits a ball. So therefore, oh, that's what it requires for the ball to go to where you want it to go. Now, so I really don't care if the speed goes down a little bit during the shot, as long as it goes back to the same speed at the beginning of the next shot, because then it's right. all the same uh, reproducibility. So uh, Z Boyer, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> that was great. We got one more quick one here, okay. just really, really fast. This is from uh, Steph Morrison. Uh, she's asking, <laughs> uh, what is your favorite FRC motor? And a corollary, what's your favorite gearbox you've ever made for FRC and why? And what year was it? <laughs> uh, okay. Well, um, yeah, I am. Um, uh, I think it's the point question. <laughs> See, uh, so I, I, I really, I, I like a lot of the motors a lot. There's some I really despise. I don't like the 550s. I really don't like the, um, the old Fisher Price motors. Yep. Um, the, um, uh, I, uh, I got to admit, I'm, I'm a, I'm a data guy. And at the moment, I'm kind of in love with the Falcon 500. Oh wow! I, okay, uh, there you go. I, I am just because. Um, you know, other than some um, um, growing pains with it, um, uh, which is reasonable, uh, I, I, I got to admit, I, I'm impressed with the performance of it. And, and um, as you know, other than reflashing the, the uh, speed controller once, I think, uh, uh, we didn't really have any problems with it once we figured a few things out. Right. I've always, I've always loved the van door. So smooth and so reliable, that worm gear motor that, that it was my sample. Um, and then the other motor that, uh, that, that I'm so happy that there's a replacement for finally is the globe motor. The globe yeah. motor, I don't believe that we ever made a robot when it was available to us that didn't have at least one globe motor in there. And if, if, for you guys that, that know about that, it was a beautiful triple planetary reduction uh, sealed motor that uh, was lovely. And a little bit of trivia for some folks that may not know this is that the bag motor was developed to replace it. And, and my understanding is that the bag really stands for a big ass globe. I understand that's the case. And the curious thing about it is that we developed a system a couple of years ago. Uh, was it last year, maybe France? It was, it was last oh, year. I remember, I remember it was last year. Yeah, we, <laughs> uh, we actually, um, because I love the globe so much, we had a bunch of them still left. I took the motors off and I modified uh, with a very simple modification and put a, put a bag motor on them. And now you have an incredibly compact, uh, low RPM, high torque motor that uses uh, all these extra uh, globe uh, triple <laughs> planetary reductions, and so I'm, and so uh, Stephanie, I, I, uh, I guess that I would have to say uh, those are my three favorite motors: the, the, uh, the globe, the Van Door, and now I've, I've got to admit I kind of like that. And the I think Falcon. I think no, I, I do I do want to look at the Neo 550 as well because I it's made the way brushless motors ought to be made. It's right. made in the way they were intended to be made. I think I think you're in, in in good company with loving the Falcon. I think that a lot of yeah. people are are really enamored with how how it performs so far. So, Very yeah, cool. yeah, and and but I but I I must admit that I I'm a bit more on the on the 550, and I uh, yeah, and this is a fairly new motor, and I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty psyched uh, by its performance, and frankly, uh, having a spinning um, um, you know external spinning rotor, that's that's perfect. That's what it's supposed to do. You know, put a little left hand cover on it, and you're good. Yep. Alrighty. Well, Ken, All right. thank you so much for joining us today. It was a lot of fun as always to, to talk with you about this stuff. Uh, uh, glad to see you're all doing well. Everybody who's watching, thank you for watching as well. We'll be 
back in just a few minutes with our next presentation. That's going to be uh, Jamie Luce from First Headquarters. She's going to talk to us about the game design and the same design process that they went through this year for Infinite Recharge. So uh, once again, Ken, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see everybody in just a few minutes. Thank you. My pleasure, Francis. Cheers, everybody. It has to also 